Tuesday was an important and tragic anniversary. It marked two years since a Dallas man drove 700 miles to El Paso, Texas, walked into a Walmart with an AK-47 style rifle, murdered 23 people and wounded dozens more. Texas Governor Greg Abbott called it one of the deadliest days in the history of Texas. But it was more than that. It was the deadliest assault on Latinos in recent American history. And that was what the accused killer intended. Authorities say he told them he had targeted Latinos and Mexicans specifically. Why? He claimed there was a Hispanic invasion of Texas and that brown people were replacing white Americans. There is a name for that. It is called the Great Replacement Theory. It's malicious, racist, and false. And in recent years, it's been a pretext for mass murders of Latinos, Muslims, and Jews by white men. Not just here in America, but in New Zealand, Germany, and Norway. Which is why, back in El Paso on Tuesday's anniversary, Latino leaders gathered to dedicate a healing garden in hopes that we all remember the victims and the source of the hatred that killed them. Two years on, has the right understood the consequences of that racism and xenophobia? The anti-American left would love to drown uh, traditional classic Americans with as many people as they can who know nothing of American history, nothing of American tradition, nothing of the rule of law. Uh, and I think that, that when you go and you look at the radical left, uh, this is their, their ideal model is to get rid of the rest of us. That's former House Speaker Newt Gingrich yesterday saying the left wants foreigners to replace, quote, traditional classic Americans. What could he mean by that? Newt was following the blueprint laid down by Tucker Carlson when he went full replacement theory on his show back in April. And last night, Carlson was on again, singing the praises of Hungary's authoritarian prime minister, who has called non-white migrants, quote, poison. Back in 2015, he decided no. We're not going to allow our nation of 10 million people to be changed forever by people we didn't invite in and who are coming here illegally. And so he put a stop to it. But it's not just Fox and it's not just replacement theory. There's a related racist conspiracy theory, one with a long history in the United States, one that blames immigrants for spreading contagious diseases in this country. And in recent days, a lot of elected Republican leaders are suggesting that migrants, as opposed to the politicization and misinformation surrounding vaccines and mask politics, are responsible for rising COVID cases. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis hit that note yesterday in a rant against President Biden. And what has he done? He's imported more virus from around the world by having a wide open southern border. You have hundreds of thousands of people pouring across every month. Not only are they letting them through, they're then farming them out all across our communities across this country, putting them on planes, putting them on buses. Who knows what new variants are out there, but I can tell you whatever variants are around the world, they're coming across that southern border. Just for the record, that's completely false and completely ridiculous. Migrant COVID infection rates no worse than America's, and the border is not wide open. To the contrary, Biden is continuing a Trump era program to deport migrants citing COVID concerns, which is frustrating many progressives and immigrant advocates who helped put him in power. DeSantis is just parroting a GOP talking point, like Texas Governor Greg Abbott. Remember him from El Paso a few moments ago? He tweeted last week that Biden is, quote, knowingly worsening the problem by importing COVID at extreme rates across the southern border. That was after a federal judge blocked an order by Abbott empowering Texas cops to stop vehicles that appear to have migrants in them, you know, because of COVID. And just today, these governors were joined by a senator. They're seeding people. They're taking kids from down at the border who may have it, and they're plucking them up and putting them all over the United States as if they're wishing to seed the country with a new variant. It's an awful thing to do. They're seeding people. Where is all this rhetoric headed? Former Trump advisor Stephen Miller seemed to answer that question last night at a forum for young conservatives in Houston. He called for a halt to all legal immigration in the United States. Yes, really. The cliche is, 
Illegal immigration equals bad, legal immigration equals good. But you've all heard that cliche before. The problem with that cliche is that just because something is legal doesn't always mean it's good, right? I would submit to you today, what this country needs on immigration is a timeout. So there it is, plain as day, it is all nativism. But Republicans are openly flouting a kind of nativism that has gotten dozens of Americans killed in recent years and treating it as a reasonable policy position. So how do you fight a hateful ideology that is fast becoming the norm in much of America? I'm joined now by Jean Guerrero. She's a columnist for the Los Angeles Times and the author of the book, Hate Monger, Stephen Miller, Donald Trump, and the White Nationalist Agenda. I'm also joined by Texas Representative Claudia Ordaz Perez, who represents El Paso. Representative, I want to begin with you. Tell me what you were feeling on the anniversary of the El Paso shooting. It felt like it was going to be this moment when people's eyes were really opened. It was going to be a turning point. And then we got more of the same rhetoric, more of the violence on January 6th. What was it like to be in your community on Tuesday? You know, it's, um, it's, we're still reeling. We're still healing from this uh, hateful act. Um, you had an individual who drove 10 hours, literally 10 hours, just to target people who look like you. Um, and the lives of 23 beautiful souls um and we're coming off of a very it's it was a hurtful legislative session where you had our governor you had you know our republican colleagues who are expressing their prayers uh for for the tragic events that happened in el paso and assured us that we were going to tackle real gun reform and the opposite happened this was the most conservative session in Texas's history. And instead of passing laws that are gonna protect uh, these types, uh, protect people who look like me, prevent future events, tragic events from happening in the future, we did the opposite. We passed uh, what's called permitless carry. In essence, you know, if you have a license to carry, um, you know, you go through training, so on and so forth, now you don't need that to carry it in the state of Texas. Um, and it was just a slap in the face. Um, and by doing nothing, session after session, it just dishonors the victims um, and, and their families. Um, and it's, it's just, it's a sad, it's a sad day. Jane, you know, we hear the representative talk about gun safety. That is one of the many policy issues this touches on. It also, of course, touches on the issue of immigration. And for years, we have heard the right say, this isn't about legal immigration. If you follow our laws, you're fine. And now you have Stephen Miller saying, you know what? There's no real difference between legal and illegal immigration. And America needs a, quote, time out from both. Jean, you literally wrote the book on Stephen Miller. And I am going to guess that you were not surprised when you heard him say that. I was not surprised. You know, I had reported in my book about how he has said before that the real problem facing America today is not illegal immigration, but legal immigration, because for him and increasingly the GOP at large, it's a demographic issue. It's about demo fears, racial racist fears about demographic change, which is something that now Governor DeSantis, Governor Abbott and many other Republican leaders are you know, they're deliberately whipping up racial anxiety about demographic change, normalizing the white supremacist conspiracy theory of replacement of white people uh, to distract from their failures to do their jobs, uh, to protect the people of their states. And it's, it's, it's repulsive and incredibly dangerous to Latinos. I mean, we're just two years from this terrible massacre in which as you as you observed, a terrorist came down um, because of that rhetoric. This this idea that there's an invasion of the at the border of people bringing crime, people bringing diseases, something that has for decades been used by white supremacists uh, to bring people into their causes, and it's completely false. But you know, in the 20s and the 1930s, immigrants used to be disinfected at the border with. Uh, Zyklon B, a cyanide-based pesticide that was later used by the Nazis in the Holocaust. Today, it is manifesting in this incredibly dangerous rhetoric and deprivation of asylum-seeking seeker, asylum families' uh, due process rights 
to to seek asylum. And and this idea that the border is open is, is completely irresponsible rhetoric because, you know, they blame Biden for inviting immigrants to the border. They're the ones who are, you know, advertising an open border, which is completely false. Um, most asylum seekers, most immigrants are being turned away right now. You know, Representative, I think about, about what Gina's saying, about the fact that you have Republican lawmakers who are using immigrants as scapegoats when it comes to COVID-19. You have the conversation that is raging in your state right now about voting rights. In so many ways, you see the anxiety about demographic change that Jean is talking about play out in Texas. And one of the reasons that I find Texas so interesting is because to me, what is happening happening in Texas is a tell. It is a prelude for what is going to happen, what could happen in the rest of the United States. You know, and that, and you, you said it perfectly, I mean, the, these policies and the, the, this, that hateful act that we're still, that we're still feeling through, all driven by hate. That's the common theme here. That same hate is what's driving these harmful voter suppression uh, laws that they're trying to really take away our freedom to vote. But the, but the real issue is that they are targeting communities of color. This is, and, and that's like communities like El Paso. You had a, n a number of communities that came out in numbers to vote safely, to vote securely. Um, and they're trying to strip those rights away from us. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, the failure when it came to really with, with this pandemic. You know, our governor has been under fire with, with just um, like, like you all were talking about earlier, really politicizing the, the, math, the masks and vaccines. It's just ridiculous um, because we need to, our jobs are to protect our communities and, and we're, doing, we're doing the opposite. You know, Jean, part of what I find so fascinating and part of what you are truly just the best at articulating is that the xenophobia isn't new. The anti-immigrant sentiments and rhetoric isn't new. What is new is just how full frontal it all is and how it is being expressed by what are considered mainstream Republicans, right? It used to be Tom Tancredo. It used to be people who were not considered mainstream and, and Republicans could say, these are just people on the fringes of our party. No, you have Governor DeSantis saying this. You have Rand Paul saying this. I mean, this is now, uh, this is completely mainstream. And my question to you is, how do the, what used to be these fringe views, how did they get laundered into mainstream GOP talking points? Well, it, that's yeah, that's exactly what happened. They were laundered. We're like we've been like frogs in a pot of boiling water, you know, slowly being exposed to these ideas that were being laundered through narratives about national security, narratives about protecting our quote unquote heritage, uh, narratives about protecting our economy, protecting uh, you know our public health. But all of these use racial tropes that have zero basis in reality. Um, and, and they're tropes that have long been used by outright white supremacist groups to recruit members of the mainstream who don't perceive themselves to be racist and don't actually um, like you know overt racism to slowly start to embrace these beliefs. So it's incredibly dangerous how they've, how they've accomplished this. Um, Stephen Miller, uh, the Trump senior advisor who I wrote the book about, it was key uh, in doing this throughout the Trump administration through the speeches that he wrote for Trump, through the policies that he enacted directly from white nationalist groups. People like white supremacist Peter Brimlow, who uh, greatly inspired Stephen Miller, are, are currently rejoicing at the language that they are hearing coming out of Governor DeSantis um, and other now, you know, members of the GOP like Tucker Carlson. They, they love it. They, they're like, wow, like, you know, our ideas have been taken up. Um, if you go to the websites of, of some of these white supremacists like like V. Dare, you'll see them, you know, rejoicing about this. Um, and it just speaks to the fact that, that there is not really a difference anymore between mainstream GOP rhetoric and, and what we what was long, you know, on the fringes of, of white supremacist groups. And Representative, what I want to underscore here is this rhetoric isn't just rhetoric. This is rhetoric that we know has consequences, right? That, that was in full effect 
two years ago. It was crystal clear. I mean, for a community like El Paso, how else do these false narratives impact the community? I mean, when you talk to the people that you represent, do they feel in their in their day to day lives the impact of this language? Absolutely. I mean, you had we were and we I remember this vividly calling on our elected leaders on the Trump administration to denounce white supremacy, to denounce that. And they couldn't even do that. Um, and it's 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 sad and, it, and it, you're, 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 you're saying it so perfectly, just embracing these types of just hateful, racist policies. Right now in the state of Texas, we're, Democrats are fighting against taking out, the, taking out what happened in our history the, you know, the, the women's suffrage movement, um, white supremacy, all of these things, they want to take that even out of our history books. Um, it's, it's, it's just, um, it's on full display. And it was this session, um, you know, and El Paso is one of the safest cities across the state of Texas. Um, one of the safest cities in the United States of America. Um, and it's, it's disheartening when you're talking to the people who live this and hearing this rhetoric and just because you're you may look a little different um and like i said we're we're one of the safest cities and and this type of hate um just came to our communities and to, to our community in, in el paso and and it's something we're, we're still healing through we're still hurting um and there's not a lot of support we don't have that support in our elected leaders we just hear nothing but false promises, a lot of prayers, but when it actually comes to passing real policies and real reforms, we're hurting communities of color like El Paso. All right, Jean Guerrero, Claudia Ordaz Perez, thank you both so much.